Welcome to the Starter Girls Podcast, your ultimate source of inspiration and empowerment. We're here to help women succeed in every area of their lives, career, money, relationships, and health and well-being. While celebrating the remarkable journeys of individuals from all walks of life who've achieved amazing things. Whether you're looking to supercharge your career, build financial independence, nurture meaningful relationships, or enhance your overall well-being, the Starter Girls Podcast is here to guide you. Join us as we explore the journeys of those who dare to dream big and achieve greatness. I'm your host, Jennifer Loading, and welcome to this episode. Welcome to another episode of the Starter Girls Podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer Loading, and wherever you are tuning in today, we are so thrilled to have you. So excited about my guest today. She has such a great story. But before we get started, I'm going to tell you just a teeny bit about her. So this story is all about exploration, adventure, and defying expectations. My guest has spent a lifetime share, excuse me, a lifetime soaring through the skies, both as a pilot and as a passionate advocate for women in aviation. She's traveled the world, conquered summits, and shared her experiences through breathtaking photography and storytelling. Not only has she inspired countless women to pursue careers in aviation, but her personal journey of resilience, perseverance, and breaking barriers offers valuable lessons for us all. So you guys are going to get to meet her in just a few minutes. But before we do that, we need to do a quick shout out to our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Walt Mills Productions. Need to add excitement to your YouTube videos or some expert hands for editing? Look no further. Walt Mills is the solution you've been searching for. Walt is not only your go-to guy for spicing up content, he's the force behind a thriving film production company with numerous titles in the pipeline. Always on the lookout for raw talent, Walt is eager to collaborate on film and internet productions. With a background deeply rooted in entertainment and promotion, Walt Mills leverages years of skills to give you the spotlight you deserve. Want to learn more about Walt and his work? Head on over to waltmillsproductions.net and let your content shine. All right. And with that, we're ready to bring our guest on today. So Lola Reed Allen, a former airline transport rated pilot, class one flight instructor, flight examiner, scuba dive master, and award-winning author and photographer. Her incredible work has appeared in publications like National Geographic and, and the Globe and Mail. She's an active member of Women in Aviation International in the 99s, and her efforts to promote the role of women in aviation has paved the way for future generations. From summoning, I'm not even going to say the name of this because I know somebody else who's done this too, and I'm excited to hear about this, to co-creating the new track scholarship for female pilots, Lola's adventurous spirit and passion are truly inspiring. So Lola, welcome to the Starter Girls show. I am so delighted to chat with you today. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm delighted to be here. You have done so spread the word. Yeah, you have done so many incredible things in your journey. And I just I love it. I love what you've done and I love what you're doing. Well, thank you. Uh it's fun. I've had a good life. There have been some some parts that maybe I could have done without, but mostly I've had a wonderful life. That's so awesome. You know, and I think it's great when you can say that, right? Like when you can say, I I feel like I've had great experiences. We know that not everything's perfect all the time, but when you can over, you know, look at the overarching experience as I've had a great time. I think that is such a blessing in itself. It is. And you have to uh, go out there and do it and, 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 and want to do it and take that first step. That's really important. And I uh, credit my, my first husband with some of that. He was in, in actual fact, he was a bully. I won't go so far to say as he was abusive, even though I realize that bullying can be abusive, right. but that makes it sound like, you know, he came home every night and, and beat me up. He did not. He was a wonderful human being. He, we had a lovely son. He is a great dad. Uh, he had a good job, all, all the good things, but he did have a problem with alcoholism. And so they, the, the spousal bullying did come into play, but I also have to credit him with saying, with helping me to fulfill a dream. So as a child, I was really discouraged about pursuing a career in aviation. And it was just a casual comment, really, when I was a little kid. Twice I said it. Once when some aerobatic planes flew over our home, I was excited and, wow, wow, wouldn't that be a fun career? And my parents didn't really say anything then, but their expressions were a bit, mm, maybe not. Mm -hmm. But later, uh, when I was seven, 
I was having just a great flight. It was really rough and bumpy. And I said, wow, this is so much fun. It's like a ride at the fair. I'd really like to be a pilot when I grew up. And my father, he, he could have said, you know, there are not many girls fly. That might be a difficult choice. But what he said was, don't be silly. Girls don't fly. So he wasn't wrong, but he was also very dismissive, which is sort of what I heard. But when I was 24 and our marriage was failing, uh, my husband came home one day and said, let's take up flying. And I was astonished because I sort of, I really had abandoned that dream. It was a dream. You know, I was an average girl from an average household. Um, the first one to finish university, go to university. And, and I did finish university as well. I just didn't think it was very realistic. And nobody I knew flew. And the only pilots I'd ever seen were male. They were mm. military male or male with the airlines. So there wasn't really anyone who, any female who was flying commercially. And that's maybe a topic we can come back to. And anyway, I said, well, where are we going to go? He said, well, you know, there's a, a local airport nearby. And we'll just, you know, go flying in a little Cessna. And we did. And I wasn't really sold on the first lesson, even though I liked it and I wanted to take more lessons. But maybe by about the fourth or fifth lesson, I thought this was great. And within the year, I had my commercial pilot's license. So it was pretty amazing. And he had uh, role models or mentors. His father was a, a veterinarian, but he had an airplane. And and uh, my husband's name was Paul. So Paul's father had an airplane and his father's brother had an airplane. In fact, between the two of them, they had three airplanes, all light aircraft. They did uh, had other careers, but that gave Paul and his siblings the visual imagery. Like dad is a pilot. Well, dad is a pilot. He's a guy. I'm a guy. I can become a pilot. And ultimately my husband, my ex-husband did uh, become a commercial pilot as well. But, and that's really important. That's why I like doing presentations. I like doing podcasts because I didn't have the support early on, although Paul was supportive um, during my private pilot training. So I didn't have the support. I certainly didn't have the encouragement until I was 24. And, you know, my husband said, let's take, let's, let's take flying. And then he was um, a mixture of encouraging and a little bit discouraging because I think he realized that flying was actually taking us further apart, not bringing us close together in the long run. Um, so I, I'd like I'd like to be out there and talking to people, talking to students, talking like that is to say high school and secondary and uh, college students, and being that visual image. And we are seeing a lot more role models today or female pilots, um, but we still need more. Yeah, this is such a great story. And, you know, and it's interesting because I always feel like, well, first of all, impressive that you had this kind of this vision, this dream when you were a child and then you actually manifested this. And, you know, it, it says so much about how, you know, we go through life and when we there are things we want to do and sometimes they don't happen right away. But if you continue to have that vision, that dream, they sort of eventually manifest in some form or fashion. Right. It's mm -hmm. like you never let go of that vision. Hmm. And it's never too late. I mean, I suppose no. that's not entirely true. I don't encourage many <laughs> 90 year olds to take up flying. But, <laughs> but, you know, if, if it's within the realm of possibility and you have the time and the money um, or time and, and you need a loan, whatever. Um, yeah. But speaking of money, it is expensive, but it isn't any more expensive than a university ed or college education okay. a for your diploma. Yeah. College. It just isn't any more expensive. And the the uh, remuneration um, when you do get hired, maybe not initially for the big air carriers, but, you know, after a few years, you're earning very good money, male or female. OK, yeah, no, my um, son in law, he has like small plane he got his license to fly in small planes and so i know somebody and i know somebody else that um i have another friend that her daughter just finished doing that as well so i think 
it's interesting when I see that, you know, that these, you see these young people doing this and stuff. And so, and, and it was funny because I remember when my um, son-in-law got, got it, he wanted to take all the kids up. And I was like, oh my gosh, he took them all, you know, different times. Oh, flying. So he was licensed by this point. Yeah, right. No, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, they just you're dropping an airplane and go, right? Like, we're just going to take off. But um, yeah, so that was kind of a neat thing for him. So I love this story. I, I think it's awesome. And, you know, and it's, it's often that, you know, it's funny that the things that we, we we talked about the dream that doesn't go away, like you have the dream and it manifests, but there's also this idea that the dream that you have, it kind of sort of gets shot down and then it still ends up coming through. And I've always talked about this, you know, with people on my podcast, because when I was young, I used to get in trouble in school a lot for talking. I'm in my fifties now. It's funny. I'm still talking, <laughs> but when I was a kid, I got in trouble for talking all the time. Cause I was social. I liked people and, you know, I get my work done and I was friends with this neighbor and this neighbor and this neighbor. And it's interesting that, you know, all those years I felt sort of bad for being kind of a gregarious kid. And this is exactly what I do now is talk. That's <laughs> you know, I do presentations and talk. So there's some truth to this that sometimes, you know, our dreams or our gift or whatever, the thing that ends up becoming a, a maybe a, a, I don't know what the word I'm looking for, but maybe negative for somebody else ends up becoming our big thing, like our big bright idea or our big endeavor, you know? And so I, I think that's an awesome, awesome story. There. And, and in fact, my, my father's, negative comment was in fact that it was in fact negative they didn't want children and mm. when i ultimately did get my private pilot license and i you know i flew home and i wanted to take my mom well i wanted to take my mom and dad and my sister flying i knew my mom was not likely going to be interested because that early flight when i said it was bumpy and rough and it was like a ride at the fair I was having a good time. She was vomiting and chain smoking because, of course, you could smoke that. She was chain smoking. Right. It's like, oh, she's like nervous. I need the cigarettes. <laughs> um, and it was it was rough. But um, my father, when I did come home, he did come for a flight with me. But he sat there and his arms were crossed and he looked his face was crossed and he was licking at his knees basically or his feet or whatever yeah. and I said dad what's wrong and he just sort of grumped, grumbled a bit and I said oh look look there's our house and I knew that he'd been in World War II um, in, in, in aviation he was an aircraft maintenance engineer but what I didn't realize until afterwards was he had wanted to be a pilot probably like every other male who joined the, the forces in World War II um, but because of hearing loss as a child um, like ear infection and subsequent hearing loss he was uh, disqualified because of a medical disability it didn't preclude him working on the ground and the but but he couldn't fly and he was very bitter and that bitterness and resentment really transferred over to me so i i felt his negativity um and kind of rejection most of my life so it wasn't the best of um of childhoods except my wonderful grandparents so and there was my shining light it's grandpa had flown with barnstormers he wasn't a barnstormer and he talked fondly about it and how he'd grown up with uh three local brothers who'd gone off to america because i'm in canada gone off to america one of them got their private license or their their commercial license came back to canada and started their own flying school and flying charter company and how exciting and how thrilled he was to have gone flying with them so i had that inspiration and he was uh, uh, very supportive in contrast to my father. So I, I am grateful to him for sure. It's awesome. It's awesome. So you are, we talked a little bit about, you know, women in aviation. I'd love for you to share a little bit on that because I know you're passionate about that. So, right. uh, so when I started <laughs> flying in 1979, um, there are, Statistics, uh, the U.S. Uh, Federal Aviation Authority compiles statistics much more effectively than some of the Canadian uh, equivalents. So when I started flying in Canada in 1979, there were 480 female commercial pilots in all of America. Okay. So we have about a tenth of the population. So that's about 48 people, women, who have a, a commercial license. So read into that. I never saw anybody in the first few years, any other female. Um, in the last couple of years, I heard and met, I heard three on the radio. I met with two of them. 
Um, but it was a rare event. And it was also further hampered. It was very lonely, but it was also further hampered by the fact that you couldn't just pick up your cell phone and PM somebody because we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have Facebook. We didn't have any of that media. And so, yes, the 99s did exist at that time. The organization Women in Aviation International, I do not believe, did exist in the 80s and uh, 70s and 80s. I think it started in the early 90s. Um, so, so I could have written a letter, but that's sort of like almost writing a letter to Santa Claus, you know, from, I was flying in the subarctic and the letters would have taken a while to get there. And it was, it was very difficult in the sense of it was lonely and Mm. occasionally, you know, there were uh, inappropriate behaviors by, by other pilots, um, either Mm -hmm verbal or sexual or sexual overtones or sexual innuendos that were a little unpleasant. And in many cases, um, there was really no one to complain to. The Canadian Human Rights Commission was newly minted, I think, in 1984. And unless you work for a very large company that was very forward thinking and the employees or that within that HR department um, were, were sort of on side, which they weren't, because they didn't really understand. The people I worked with didn't understand why a female was flying. They, some of them were quite receptive, but they still didn't understand. Like their mothers, their sisters, very few of them, uh, in fact, none in my experience, were, were professional women. They might have a job, but it was more like working in the dress shop. Nothing wrong with that. We all need dresses. Um, but, sure. but that was sort of what they aspired to, and that was great. But it made me seem quite an, an anomaly you know, a mm-hmm. show to the water mm-hmm. sort of thing. And one of the guys that I mentioned in the book, we're walking across the hangar towards the passenger or pilot exit door, as opposed to the big hangar doors. And he stops and he puts his hand on the door handle. And I think he's going to open it, right? But he doesn't. He's standing there and he looks at his feet. And then he says, you know, the problem with you is, and I'm thinking, what? The problem with mm. me? And then he kind of smiles and he says, because he was quite shy, actually. He said, we just yeah. don't know how to treat you. Like, for example, mm-hmm. I'm going to open this door. Should I go through first, which is what I do for the other guy, for the guys, everyone else that I fly with. But should I open the door and let you go through? Because, yeah, you're a female, but you're just you're a pilot, too. So they were all confused. And that was just a perfect example that I thought. Yeah, it's like they didn't know how to treat me, and the they probably reverted back to how they treated other women in general, which in many cases wasn't that great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's an interesting story, and I and I could see that. I mean, you're it's you're going into an area, yeah, that's just not heavily populated by the by the female right. demographic. But, but I think you know you you set. Doing this, I mean, a couple of things, it, it's it you paved the way. You kind of paved the way for, you know, to, to help other women see that this can be done. But also your personal character, I think, is what's standing out to me because you've got this. I feel like this sort of like, tell me I can't do something and I'm going to kind of I'm going to do it personality. You know, and so I love it. You're when you were talking about everybody in the family kind of you know doing this and this and like you were kind of an anomaly. I just I, I can sense a little bit of that fighter fighting spirit in you you know what i mean to to defy defy the normal you know and i love it my my mother at one point in high school said to me you know lola if you you're gonna if you don't stop bucking the system you're gonna have a difficult life and i would say that i've had a difficult life but it's been very rewarding so lots of challenges gonna say difficult or challenging but she's Right. I was going to say, you're going to say worth it because that's exactly the way I would feel they, to me. And, and, and this is not a good or bad. I want to preface that and say that because there are people that need to be different, right? Like some of us just don't like to be the right. same. We don't want to be like everybody else. And, and I don't think that's a right or wrong. But, you know, I had another woman on my show a few weeks ago that is a race car driver. Ooh. She started race car driving at 50. She's 60 oh, now. And right. she a little red Corvette. Ooh. It's on the front of racing magazines. Oh, I, I mean, you can, she goes by fast lane, Jane, Jane Thurman, <laughs> a neat lady, but I had so much fun with her. And we were kind of talking a little bit about that, about just being different. You know, she said, 
we could, she said I had to find something. She she started it really to find a way to connect with her boys because they had a they have a, a some kind of I think it's a, a it's a shop for cars. I don't know if they're doing rut, old cars, what type or what they're doing there, but she wanted to find a way to connect with her son. So she started doing this, I guess, race car driving or whatever, and that became the thing. And then she just really enjoyed the ride driving the cars. And she said, you know, I could have started knitting and doing these other things, but I didn't. Entrepreneurs, are you ready to level up your leadership skills? Tune in now for an exclusive offer designed just for you. This is my time. Did you know 63% of consumers prefer businesses aligned with their values? Recognizing your core values isn't just vital for business growth, it's the bedrock of effective leadership. Whether you're a seasoned entrepreneur or an aspiring creator, identifying your core values is a key step in constructing the framework of a successful leader, enabling you to lead authentically, expand your business, and live life on your terms. Are you ready to access tools to kickstart your leadership journey? Unlock a treasure trove of insights and get your free resources at www.linktree forward slash Jennifer Loading. Take that crucial first step toward realizing your leadership aspirations and elevate your leadership game today. Ready to shine, brighter than ever. You know, <laughs> she wanted to drive cars. That's awesome. You know? so That's awesome. I I think you said even in the beginning, you know, it doesn't really matter unless you, to me, if you have a physical limitation or a real reason why you can't do something, age doesn't matter. And if you want to do it and be different, be different. Right. Absolutely. So and it's saying, funny, the world's funny about comes. what you say, the, I don't know, maybe contrary or be different. There's a, 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 a very short story, bit, a little story in, in my memoir early on that there was a few little snippets of my early life. And one of them was when I was four years old, I wanted to, or three or four, I wanted to ride my tricycle. And I did two, two or three blocks away, which was bad enough for a little kid, but also to a construction zone because I was fascinated with the the big trucks and the land mo movers and all that. I loved it. And there's one incident where, you know, I'm, I say, you know, I'm going to go ride my bike and my mother's going, don't go near the construction zone. You know what? She's busy. <laughs> She's busy doing something. So where do I go? Right to the construction zone. I did get in trouble for that really big time, but um, it, it and it probably stopped me from going for a little while. But I was fascinated, and I, I didn't see any problem with it. I obviously a three year old can't make those effective judgments, but I knew if I stayed far enough away, I wasn't planning and going into the construction pit that it should be okay. But my mother, my mother felt otherwise. But. Um, there are a lot more women flying today. So we're, we are a lot more visible. Um, and a lot of the early mentality um, against women in aviation is dissolving. And women have been flying since 1910, but it was only really in the 19, in 1973 that women broke into commercial aviation. And even okay. then, it was just a little, a little nudge. So the first female commercial pilot in North America was in 1934. Was Helen Grishy. She only lasted maybe a year, a year and a half, because the all male pilot union appealed to the what is now the Federal Aviation Authority, and they said that you know women shouldn't be flying at night because it was too dangerous, even though they were, and women shouldn't be flying during bad weather. And so today we call that constructive dismissal. And she eventually yeah. just quit. But then it wasn't until 1973, so 39 years later, that women broke into commercial yeah. aviation. And there was a little or a, a big well, bubble in 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 between the that those four decades during World War II where women did fly military airplanes and they were flying in mm. essence they were flying commercially but it was seen as helping the men that is helping the men helping america helping canada and britain these women stepped in to an airplane and flew the airplanes around to um air, air, air bases and to man, from manufacturing places to air bases they flew new planes they flew planes that needed to be repaired and that let men fly uh, military planes in combat but mm -hmm. they weren't really considered commercial pilots so in 1973 
the two in America, one in Canada, and then the next in Canada was 1978, and then I started in 1979. So although I wasn't really the first, only that first right. wave of people. And I know my own grandfather, who whom I spoke just brief, briefly a few moments ago as being my guiding light and my, my, my psychological Again. savior. When I told him I was quitting my job at the bank, which was a good job, I admit, he said, oh, no, you know, you shouldn't do that. And I said, well, you know, planes today, they're a whole lot safer than they used to be, you know, much more uh, uh, monitored uh, in terms of production and maintenance. He said, oh, it's not that. He said, you'll be taking jobs from men. And that was in 19, 1980, actually, when I when I when I quit my job. Yeah. So that that mm. still that was still that feeling. Um, and one of the pilots I flew with thought I was flying because I needed the money because I couldn't keep a husband to support me. So very, very strange okay. perceptions. So there are a lot more yeah. females flying today, which is encouraging a lot more people flying, women flying as instructors, as charter pilots um, for the airlines, working as aircraft maintenance engineers. But in terms of flying, although our numbers have increased, the percentage is still only about 6% of females are commercial pilots. And that's a worldwide statistic. So we yeah. need to be out Who's there. Well we managed, need to be more visible. Next on the list, um, make sure talking that about it, having conventions, and, after, and um, then any other the public, time that I have and, can be spent on building the podcast, uh, building a personal being brand, as, uh, visually, but also as role as well. models and explaining the the perks of the 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 training and the the um, the career and and making suggestions. I mean, maybe not everybody wants to be a pilot either, right? That's part of it. But there's also that one of the one of the early reasons maybe not early, but say in the 1990s and the beginning of this century, well, a lot of women said, well, I, a, a lot of flight attendants said, oh, well, I don't want to be a, a pilot because that would take me away from home too often, which makes no sense whatsoever. So a lot of women, yeah. oh, that's why I'm looking yeah, at my <laughs> away from home too often, but I'll be a flight attendant. Yeah. So, so it's an issue of perception. Can I do it? No, I guess I can't. And you do need to be confident and you need to be um, determined and courageous sometimes. Yeah. That's what I would have asked you next for somebody who's even wanting to, you know, go into that space. What would you recommend to them? And I like this. You said confidence. Yeah, you, and, you need and to what believe you in yourself. And yeah. I mean, some of these are challenged, yeah. right? I think everyone who's starting mm -hmm. a new job has at some point felt like an imposter, you know, the imposter syndrome, but that right. continues more often with women in any non-traditional career because right. you're right. constantly or almost constantly evaluated and judged. And you're judged with the idea that you're not really competent to begin with. So if a man is mm -hmm. hired, he's just sort of assumed that he's going to be competent and yeah, he may mess up a little bit, but there is right. that, that very subtle a priori assumption that women maybe just quite aren't as qualified. And I'm certainly not speaking for everybody. And that attitude is right. changing. Um, there still are fewer female uh, students than male students. That's about 12% female mm -hmm. compared to 88% um, male. But the numbers are changing. And as that, that World War II attitude of men belong in the cockpit and women belong at home, uh, that's changing as, as they, they retire. And even the next generation still had the, the one that I was in, still felt a lot of that negativity towards women in non-traditional occupations. But that is changing um, because they see so yeah. many, they do see so many uh, women flying. And a lot of females um, are their instructors. So they can see that women are yeah. flying and that are very, they're very competent. That's awesome. Now, while you were talking about that, I was th thinking about like, I, what was that? I don't know if I read it or they were talking about like when the difference between when women and men apply for a job and a guy will apply for a job if he's missing some of the qualifications, whereas women think they have to have every single qualification. And you know what? And I, I could probably attest to that because there was a period of time a while back, I was looking at trying to find something part-time and I was going through the ads and I'd be like, oh, I'm missing this. I'm missing this. I can't apply for that. And then I got to a point where I was like, you know what? I'm just going to send them in anyways. I'm just going to do it. I started going the other way. I'm just going to send it right. in and see if anything happens, right. you know? Because I think we do. You mentioned the imposter syndrome. And I'm actually right now, because I just 
built out um, a high ticket course for women entrepreneurs. And I'm back, I'm engineering it backwards. So I'm creating a quiz right now, which is a, is a lead funnel, but it's talking about like the number one subconscious block that women entrepreneurs have. And imposter syndrome is one of the things that I'm addressing in there, you know, obviously with money and fear of success, all those other things. But that is a big one, I think, because it, it plays also into like money and how we how we work with our clients and what we ask for. And so I think, you know, in listening to your story here, this whole thing of confidence is so relevant here, because especially when you had to go through this situation where you were in a heavily, you're still a heavily do male dominated yes. industry. But you were like in the beginning, like, you know, there you mentioned that I wrote all I was writing these names down as you were talking about them. You were in the beginning of this. And having to go against some really, like you mentioned, perceptions, some very high, you know, stigmas and perceptions about what women can and cannot do in the in the aviation department, you know. And so I think it's it's awesome that you're now able to talk about this and get out and and kind of let people know, hey, this is okay if you want to do this. You can pursue this if this is a passion right. of and, yours. And I do want to emphasize that. Maybe you don't want to be a pilot, but there are a lot of other careers that you can do within the aviation yeah. industry. You could be the lawyer for an aviation company, for example, um, you know, um, work with the radios. There's a lot. There's about 40 different careers that you can can do and still be within the aviation industry, um, you know, aerospace engineering. Uh, but I guess you, what I said, you have to be confident in yourself and that confidence comes. So when I took my first lesson. Um, well, I'm going to call it a lesson. It's called the FAM or the familiarization flight. And it's about 20 minutes. Sometimes it's a bit longer, right. but mine was about 20 minutes. And, you know, the fellow put the aircraft through the paces and, you know, you pull back and the nose goes up and push forward, the nose goes down. And But it was a really pretty casual, quick, and I mean, 20 minutes from the time we got into the airplane to the time we were back and the engine was shut down. And at one point he said, so want to try it? Want to take control? I was like, no, absolutely not. But I will, you know, once once I have a, a real lesson where, you know, we kind of go through it step by yeah. step, because I was kind of boggled all those bells and whistles. But don't let that deter you. Uh, you know, obviously, you have to have a little bit of confidence. But at my fan flight, I wasn't, I had a job with the bank that was a perfectly good job, as my parents wanted to tell me the next year when I quit it. Um, and it was a good job. But I wasn't that happy, but I certainly didn't think aviation was going to be my next career. It wasn't really until maybe three quarters of the way through. It's like, yeah, I can do this. So my confidence built. And I, maybe a good analogy would be if you're, you know, you've just started university. For those of you who are in university, you've been there a month now. It's your first year. You're not worried about your fourth year finals. If you were, if you were to take them now, right. you'd fail because you're not mm -hmm. ready. So it doesn't mean that you're not capable. Right. It just means that you're simply not ready to take your fourth year finals in physics because you haven't got that far yet. Same thing. I would have failed the flight test if on my third hour they tried to give me a flight test. Obviously, I just couldn't meet the meet the challenges or the expectations because I had no idea what they even were. And all the bells and whistles on the dials right. and stuff. Um, you know, you just kind of learn things and I remember the first time yeah. uh, coming back from the practice area and I was flying the airplane and we were actually going in the right direction and it was all good. And my instructor th said, said to me, okay, now it's time to contact a uh, tower. And he thrust the mic at me and I, I was speechless. It was like, what? You want me to fly and talk? How is that even possible? Right. So of course now you can, now you can fly and talk or I can fly and talk. <laughs> You learn, didn't you? Sometimes that's how you learn, right? <laughs> step by step by step. And you just yes. take that first step. And I mean, you have to be realistic. Um, today, it's taking a lot longer to get a, a license than it used to. Um, they want to train. The, yeah. the training has improved. That's certainly, um, and it's more thorough. I mean, it used to be that I think the World War I pilots got a couple hours of flight instruction and off they went. And, and now anywhere from 50 to maybe 70 or 80 hours of, in, of instruction, of, of, of flight time, sorry. Some of it is dual instruction flight and time. some of it is solo flight time. But say 60 to 90 hours of being in the airplane, either alone or with your instructor. It's, it's a lot safer. The mm -hmm. training is improved for yeah. sure. Awesome.
And I was been taking notes, listening to you. So you got a book. Tell us a little bit about this book that well, you have out here. Now. It is Highway to the Sky and Aviator's right. Journey. Now, um, I love the cover. It really is a photo of me um, and a real airplane. It was taken in Whitehorse in the Yukon um, just after I'd been up there a week and I was getting my dog mushing certificate uh, and I had a great time. I absolutely loved it. But I thought, I've got a couple days. Why don't I go flying? And so this turned out to be such a great photo. Uh, it isn't the biggest plane I flew, but it, it kind of talks about you know being alone sort of has that feeling of loneliness and the original photo and i say the plane and i we're the real thing but the photo or the cover itself it used to have buildings because we're at an airport but now they've you know put in um evergreen trees and a little bit of misty fog and some northern lights and snow and the publisher is in san diego so doesn't this just say canada 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 <laughs> um so i wrote the book because I, there were a lot of stories that I thought would be fun to share. There's some scary stories, some fun stories. I wanted it to be inspirational, but I also wanted it to be realistic. And it's not just about aviation. Um, in fact, a recent uh, review I got uh, from the Midwest Book Review, uh, Helen Dumont said this book should be included, not just in personal libraries for a, a fun or an interesting read, but also in college and university libraries in women's issues, because that's really what the book is. Um, yeah. I had a developmental okay. editor who pointed that out to me. I thought I was writing about aviation, and it turns out that I wasn't. Um, I'm writing about aviation, but that aviation or flying or taking on a big challenge was really a metaphor for finding out who you are as a woman and yet meeting those challenges as well. So I had, you know, a difficult upbringing. My parents were wonderful, but when they don't really, didn't really want children, it was more like being raised by a, a nanny, a loving nanny for sure, but not, it's not quite the same. So I had some some emotional baggage from, as I suppose most of us do from being a teenager, but a little bit of extra uh, than some. And then the challenge of, of falling in love and having a wonderful husband, only to find out that he really is an alcoholic and with a with a bullying problem. And there is an incidence of violence in there. So we get a little bit of domestic abuse and relationship challenges that I went through after my divorce. And, you know, finally finding uh, the right person to whom I've been married for 26 wonderful years. Uh, and interestingly enough, he too, like my first husband, had um, a mentor in his father and uncle. Kind of strange. Only in his case, he was a he is a physician. His father was an, uh, um, a gynecologist. His father's brother, so his uncle, was an ophthalmologist. And their grandfather was a general physician, a family physician. So at age six, my husband, current husband, knew he could be a doctor. His father was a doctor. His uncle was a doctor. Um, should be no yeah. problem. I mean, I'm, wow. I'm sure there were problems, but, you know, there's that that image that here is my role model. and he'll be there for me or she'll be there for me. And when I say he or she, there are a lot of women today whose role models are their fathers who are professional pilots or pilots or people who are aviation enthusiasts. So if you have anybody like that, it's great. But if you don't, you can, you know, reach out to the 99's International Organization of Women Pilots. And it started off in 1929 with Amelia Earhart and 98 other women, hence the 99s. So it's grown from 99 to something like 7,500 women in um, about 56 different countries, primarily in America, for sure. So there, almost anywhere you go yeah. in America, there'll be a chapter. There are 12 chapters in Canada, I believe. Um so there's a lot of support you can get that way. Also, Women in Aviation International. And then locally, when my very first flight, that fam flight, I was the only female at the airport. And that included my son, my three-year-old, and my husband. Everybody, the support staff, the pilots, the instructors, the ramp rats, uh, the ramp, ramp uh, people, they were um, all male. And, and I, mean, I kind of expected that, so it wasn't a surprise. But now yeah. when you go, uh, you're almost 
not guaranteed, but it's highly probable if there isn't a female instructor, there will be female students. So you can get, you know, a bit of camaraderie with them. It's not that I can't talk to men yeah. and have a deep and meaningful conversation, but there are some conversations that maybe are just a little bit better when shared with a woman. And I'm sure yeah, men feel the same I way. I agree. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you on that. No, this is such an awesome story. Awesome story. I think what you're doing is incredible. So one last thing I want to ask you is, and this is going to be kind of a fun question for you. I think you'll like this one. So I would love to know, what do you love about flying? What freedom. is this for you? The actual physical mm -hmm. feeling is freedom. Um, it's very okay. tranquil. I mean, yes, you've got the engine or engines, you know, r rolling around. And the 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 sound yeah. of the jet or the propeller, but it's like floating on a carpet, assuming it's reasonably smooth. But just the feeling of it's empowering, knowing that you're flying a machine and that you are you and you alone are responsible for the safe conduct of that flight and the safety of your passengers, if that's applicable. But just being up there in the plane, I like flying alone best of all, um, and I think a lot of um, major air carrier pilots will, will, will second that by the, the simple fact that they also have light aircraft and they, that for them is really flying. And that, that's the fun part, just flying up there by yourself, maybe taking a passenger or two, but generally just having a good time and not having to be on a scheduled service and flying from A to B and making sure, you know, everything is, all your passengers are happy. The flying itself is, is, is refreshingly, tranquil and empowering at the same time. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I, I like to ask those questions sometimes because I think those are the personal questions that we get to dive into and people, why, what is it about it that you love? Well, this has been amazing. So anybody listening to this, let's say they want to pick up the book, they want to get in touch with you. They want to follow you, learn more about your story, all the good things. Where would you like us well, to send Well, you can go them? to my website, which is lolareadallen.com. The book is in some bookstores, but it can be ordered um, via, it's distributed by uh, Simon & Schuster, and you can order it from um, uh, from Simon & Schuster, but you can also order it from amazon.com, amazon.ca, Indigo in Canada, which is Chapters Indigo, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, okay. which is BAM. Uh, any independent bookstore, they, they'd be able to get it no problem whatsoever. And I, I want to mention too that I also wrote this book because it was when I was flying, it was sort of a, an, an empty zone between World War II and then so what, what's happening today, and we are getting a lot more women. So I wanted it to be sort of a his, an historical perspective. Um, but also, what spurred me was that some of the some of the, the comments that I received in the 80s and 90s, women are still hearing that. And I find that very surprising. Mm -hmm. And so if they're still hearing that, uh, I wonder what else is happening. And I, for example, a couple of weeks ago, I said as much to a, a female instructor in, in Oshawa. And I said, do you ever hear any of that anymore? And she said, yeah, just a couple of weeks ago, I had this guy, he was you know, maybe in his 50s, and and I, I don't remember if he was a student or she was just taking him up for a local sightseeing flight, but they went out from the, mm -hmm. the, the dispatch office onto the ramp and she did the walk around, checking the fuel, the oil, the tires, all the movements of the controls. And then at the end, she, I presume she said something like, let's go. And he's kind of hesitant. And she said, did you forget something? And he said, well, Aren't we waiting for the pilot? And that was, I'm going to say maybe it was three weeks ago now, I guess, but it was certainly in very recent history. So there's still that disconnect. So we, we, have, we have a long way to go. Yeah. But I yeah, uh, interesting, can have interesting. people uh, email me. Well, it's Lola at Lola Reed yeah. Allen. I'm happy. I'll, I do answer my email okay. um, as promptly as possible. Um, and as I say, it's it, it's been well received. It's considered inspirational, a good read. Um, some, um, but it, it, within the context of women's issues from a historical perspective. 
Very good. Very good. We'll make sure um, too, Lola, when this gets out and we do the show notes, we'll Perfect. make sure that we get awesome. your website in there too. So they know where to get you. I bet if they put your I name so. in there, you'll probably pop up pretty easily. <laughs> We don't have to search too hard for you. Well, your story, I, I thank you for sharing all this. No, I think it is great. I think what you've done is impressive. It's remarkable. I love what you're continuing to do and, you know, and, and championing for women and, and getting helping them, you know, pave the path forward so they can do some of these things that they want to do in life. I think it's great. I do want to say to our audience, if you found this episode informative and inspirational, I hope you did. Head on over to any of the platforms that you support and you can hit that like, subscribe, share, comment, do whatever you feel like you want to do. And then please go check out Lola's book. Check her out on her website and see what you can keep up with what she's doing. And as I always say, in order to live the extraordinary, you must start. And every start begins with a decision. You guys take care, be safe, be kind to one another, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.